Civil aviation in South Africa has come a long way during the last 50 years. Huge progress has been made since the days of the Junkers Ju-52 aircraft. Today, the little machine is dwarfed by the mighty jumbo jet that has taken its place. But the role that it played in developing commercial air transport can never be forgotten. When the country's national airline was formed in 1934, it was only a handful of engineers, pilots and staff. But the enterprise grew quickly. By the time the Junkers joined the fleet, the South African public had become accustomed to travel on the blue and silver way. It was an exciting, romantic, almost magical era. The aeroplane was something new, and the travelling public loved it. Air travel was here to stay. From their cabin in the sky, passengers thrilled to the new experience. Africa unfolded below. And soon, timetables brought regular scheduled services within everybody's reach. But for the pilots, it wasn't always fun. In the cockpit during those early days, Otto Schelin. Flying down to Cape Town in winter uh, in the Junkers Ju-52s, you know, you'd at times meet up with icing conditions. This ice would form along the leading edge of the wings and upset the aerofoil section. And of course, the normal lift drag ratio was upset and this aircraft, you could do what you like, started sinking. It just wouldn't stay in the air. Of course, there's no such thing as sticking your nose down trying to get out of these icing conditions, conditions in a hurry because the faster you go, the faster this ice settles on the wings. So it's just a question of pulling throttles back and trying to lower yourself. But just remember, there are a few mountains beneath you too, and you know this. So what can one do? You're absolutely helpless. Fortunately, we never ran into any serious trouble, and we were always able somehow or other to get to an area where this ice melted when we came back to a normal flying condition and uh, visibility, and uh, eventually, of course, got to our destination with our hearts still beating. But passengers were undeterred. They wanted adventure. There was an odd occasion where the passengers would ask us to go, go down lower, in which case we'd oblige, provided they all agreed. Well, all meant about three passengers. And uh, then we'd get down to the coast. And, uh, well, when flying along the coast, we'd say, Durban, East London, Port Elizabeth, Mossel Bay, and Cape Town. We'd see fish jumping, and, oh, there was so much to see fun to be had flying low. Today, the, the, the pilot, he has to file a flight plan from A to B, and he flies from A to B, and he flies at night. And nobody sees anything, or he's flying over the water, you don't see anything. Where those early days, you did actually see the scenery, and you could appreciate the type of country you're flying over. And I think this is one of the reasons why pre-war flying was more of a sightseeing tour, really, than it is today, which is only a convenience for flying from A to B. We used to have the, the names painted on the top of the station roofs to help the pilots, should they come over the berg and then come down the Tugela Valley or, or find a railway station, and they could see what railway station and which way they could go. And this was very important. It was a standing joke at one time that, this, that no pilot on South Avenue always flew without a railway timetable because um, he could then see where he was. In the old days when we started, flying across the Free State from Durban to Germiston, we used to get fed up if a farmer cut a tree down because we used to use that tree as a navigational aid. As the airline developed and as new routes were started, it was realized that accurate navigation maps were essential. In 1935, the compilation of the charts began. Responsibility was given to a young master navigator, now retired in England, Air Marshal Sir Edward Chilton. 
the Union had been met from a primary point of view, but not the sort of secondary point of view. The air maps were virtually blanks with just railway lines and uh, outlines of towns marked on them. And so we embarked on a fairly hefty survey project, which eventually led to the production of a half million series, which is, it was in fact produced before I left the Union, uh, almost in its entirety. And I was happy to see that this same map is in use today. Hello, ZSAFD calling Jamison Air Radio. Another aid to navigation, radio. Even though procedures and equipment were still primitive at the time. ZSAFD calling Jamison Air Radio. Position now over Berg. Please give weather conditions and height of lowest cloud. Hold up. Jamison calling ZSAFD. Jamison calling ZSASD. Jamison calling ZSASD. Sky 18. On course, on time, the aircraft safely on its way to its destination. But in those days, the airports left a lot to be desired. Ground engineer Steve Grover was based at Durban Stamford Hill Aerodrome. There were no hard runways, it was just grass, and these aeroplanes were quite heavy by comparison to anything else around at that time. The pilot might come taxiing in and the next thing he'd hit a soft patch and the aeroplane would sink right down and lie flat on the grass and wouldn't stop if the wings hadn't been there. And then we just have to dig them out and jack them up bit by bit until we got them onto steel plates. Then we would drag it 10 or 15 foot at a time back to the hard standing where we used to service them. On one occasion, we had all three air 52s on, in, in, uh, bogged on the ground at the same time, a, AFA, AFB, and AFC. And they put the whole airline out because uh, all the, uh, the other stations inland didn't have any airplanes to operate through them. So this made life a little, little bit difficult. We, we didn't have any rules and regulations to work to. And being the first people in the airline, it's really us who really laid down the first rules and regulations of how an aircraft should be operated. There was no such thing as a handbook. All tickets, please, ladies and gentlemen. The airliner played an important role in the development of the country's economy. Johannesburg, with its growing financial importance, and the burgeoning Transvaal goldfields were now less than a day away from coastal cities and ports. 1937, air services are extended beyond the country's borders for the first time. Now, South Africa is linked with northern and southern Rhodesia, and then onwards to Lake Victoria in Kenya. The route to Nairobi and Kisumu was particularly popular and exciting. The whole flight uh, plan was in the hands of the, uh, of the commander of the airplane, and he had a decision where he would like to fly or where he didn't want to fly. And I found it extremely interesting, from, both from a passenger point of view and from an interesting point of view. Because if you had passengers who wanted to see the scenery and the game over the Serengeti Plains or, or a Nongorongora crater or something like that, the pilot would, uh, if he was a keen photographer and he knew where to find the game, he would deviate and, and go and show them, and we'd be flying pretty low. And also, uh, on these flights, now, the pilots knew a lot of people along the route and they always used to arm themselves with the Sunday Times and they used to fly over these farms and, and drop the, the Sunday Times to their friends. By now, the airline had expanded considerably. From its base at the Rand Airport, the blue and silver fleet crisscrossed the African sky. Staff was increased and it was soon time to introduce new aircraft in the form of the Junkers Ju-86. deviated from the other junkers in that it was smooth skin, not the corrugated, as we call them, the corrugated iron that was on the Ju-52. But the new plane's civilian career was short-lived. By 1939, the world was at war.
As hostilities flared in Europe, the Blue and Silver Fleet was grounded and the aircraft taken away for conversion into military machines. A pilot at the time, Dennis Robenheimer. Within a matter of days, the, the entire airline staff was taken over by the Air Force, or practically the entire staff, and certainly all the pilots and, uh, and the aircraft. We were uh, dispersed into coastal flights at uh, the main coastal centers doing coastal patrol work. Many men also went up to North Africa. One of them was a young airways engineer, Mac McKendrick. We left here about May 1940, I recall, and from there we went to East Africa with the Junkers 86s. And uh, we did the uh, Abyssinian campaign. And when the Abyssinian campaign was finished in Addis Ababa, when uh, we uh, left the 86s there and we then went re-equipped with more modern aircraft and went to the Middle East. Back in South Africa, more pilots underwent training. One of them, an officer by the name of Pai Pinar. It was he who encountered one of the first Luftwaffe jets during the war. His mosquito was no match for the Messerschmitt, but shot to pieces, the aircraft was brought down safely. Pinar was awarded the DFC and an AFC decoration soon followed. In later years, this remarkable pilot would become chief executive of South African Airways. 1944, the airline is reformed to fly a domestic service. To get things going, military aircraft are converted for civilian use. Well, at the end of the war, 1944, Airways recalled all its pilots uh, to reform Airways. And um, I think there were 12 left of the original 33. And we came back to fly Lodestars and Dakotas on the internal services. And, and shortly after, uh, reforming airways, I, along with uh, seven others, were sent overseas to uh, to learn to fly the Avro York with a view to starting the Springbok services. This was the real beginning of the country's international air services. Now, for the first time, the South African flag was carried aloft as the Springbok service connected Johannesburg with Britain. In the early days, when we started the Springbok service, it took us three days to get to London. We only did day daylight flying. The passengers night stopped, and the crew, of course, night stopped at hotels. We tried to arrange all our landings so that the passengers could have their food on the ground, not in the air. In the air, there was only sandwiches and tea and coffee but it was a case of help yourself. There were no hostesses, no stewards. We had to pass through the intertropical convergence zone at some point flying uh, up Africa. And this was where the, the main thunderstorm activity took place. When we left Khartoum on our southbound, we used to fly through central Africa there and it was always, there was always a, a lot of rain. And we were flying at about probably 6,000 feet in very, very heavy rain. And this was usual, the crews, we didn't mind it at all, but the passengers didn't seem to like it very much. It was very turbulent. Anyway, the steward called me, he said, man, there's something going on in the cabins, and I walked back, and there was a little passenger there, he was an Englishman with a little bowler hat on, and his striped trousers and his nice little black jacket, and he thought this was how it was supposed to be. The ventilator above him, the water was pouring all over him, but this didn't seem to worry him. He thought, well, this is how it is. When you fly through Central Africa, you get wet. Now, the Avro York was a converted edition of the Lancaster bomber. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't have a very big payload. It only carried about 14 passengers. But I suppose it was quicker than going by boat, so it served its purpose very well. I was on the uh, servicing side of those aeroplanes at Paul Midfontein, and I must say, I became very attached to the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Although it had wonderful engines, it was underpowered. As a matter of fact, they, they used to say that the only reason why it ever got off, got off the ground was because of the curvature of the earth. We uh, hired the Yorks from uh, British Airways at that time, B uh, BOAC, uh, on our overseas service, and we, we ordered uh, 
Douglas DC Force, and in 1946, uh, we started our overseas service on the uh, old Skymaster, the DC-4. Well, the DC-4 was a very much nicer airplane to operate, and had a lot more passengers. I think it we flew with 40 passengers. It wasn't pressurized like modern aircraft today, and we were in the weather most of the time, and I still don't know how those passengers lasted out, because for the whole flight, we'd be bumping all the way. How the hostess and steward managed, I wouldn't know. I believe that uh, we have in-flight movies now, which are all airlines throughout the world, and it seems as though they think that's a brand new innovation. But in those days, we used to have a Bell and Howe projector, 60 millimeter projector, and had uh, films in flight on the DC-4s. The DC-4, uh, we kept that in service until uh, 1950, when uh, Airways uh, ordered the Lockheed Constellation. I then went over to the United States uh, to do the first course on the uh, Lockheed uh, 749. Returned also in 1950 and started converting our pilots uh, onto the uh, Constellation. That was quite an improvement, uh, high-speed aircraft on the overseas service with a good range. During this post-war period, South Africa was undergoing economic revitalization, and its airline developed quickly. As demand increased, more destinations in Europe were added to the route network. But let's go backwards in time for a moment, to an important day in 1947. The place, Kempton Park. Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery, Monty of Alamein, officially names the country's new international airport. Young Smuts will become the major aerial gateway between South Africa and the rest of the world. 1953, the complex is duly opened and on October the 4th of that year, a brand new aircraft arrives. The world's first pure jet, the Comet. Oh, the Comet was a tremendous experience. This, this was something um, quite new and very exciting. A group was chosen to go over, a group of um, pilots and engineers, and later navigators as well. We did a long course with the de Havilland Aircraft Company and uh, flying with BOAC at London Airport. Uh, a tremendous experience. And um, we were very sorry when they were, were eventually taken off because they were the most delightful aircraft to fly too. A certain amount of crews were selected for the Comet and we flew the Comet in uh, collaboration with BOAC. We actually used their airplanes and uh, we used to alternate services with them and interslip crews as well. For example, a South African crew would go as far as Cairo and the British crew would take over. And that's how you worked your way to England and on your way back again. I must say, although they were taken off the service, they did a, a wonderful job uh, in pioneering the jet service. Uh, the metal fatigue problem was solved uh, through research in uh, the UK. And I think that the other companies that came in later on, like Boeing and Douglas, they uh, they benefited a lot from that experience. 1956, the fastest piston-engined commercial airliner ever built, the Douglas DC-7B. The crews undergo training at the factory in the United States. While at home, plans are made to inaugurate a new service with the machine. November 25th, 1957, and the Douglas crosses the Indian Ocean to Mauritius, the Cocos Islands, and then eastwards to Australia. Australian service became a very, very good, very popular service. Of course, uh, Qantas Airways, they introduced a reciprocal service, uh, uh, more or less at the same time as SAA. Nineteen sixty, and all was ready. This was the dawn of a new age. The age when jet travel would completely alter the world of aviation for all time. This was the age of the big jet, the Boeing.
Seattle, July 1960. South Africa's first 707 is officially handed over. On its delivery flight to Johannesburg, the aircraft covers the 18 and a half thousand kilometers in just over 21 hours. More powerful versions of the jet soon follow, and the overseas route network is expanded. For a time, all was well, until a fateful day in August 1963. Suddenly, the grass curtain comes down over Africa. The flying springbuck is banned from its skies. Chief executive at the time, Jimmy Adam. Well, I think anyone who was in the airline at that time, I'm talking about 1963 now, will all agree that the operation Ompot, as we called it, that was the round the bulge operation, was the finest hour of the airline. This was something which we had anticipated for a pretty long time. Uh, we had prepared for it, and we had instructions from the minister that we had to be able to reorganize the route without the loss of a single service. Well, it's history now that this is what we were able to do. And I can only recall the tremendous enthusiasm of all the air crew. Banned from flying the direct route over Africa, the only way to reach Europe was now via the bulge. A longer journey requiring additional fuel, but there was no other option. Captain Riderman, de Villiers Riderman and myself, we went up into Spain and Portugal. We flew down to Las Palmas and to the Cape Verde Islands. And we also flew up to Luanda from here. So uh, we got the, uh, the experience uh, on this route before it became necessary. But it, it was, uh, we then expected this to happen and we organized it for Captain Riderman and myself never to be away at the same time. Pipe Pino happened was deliberately had been stationed in London for such an occurrence. He came out of the service and joined, uh, joined my service at, at Rome to, uh, to take me initially around the bulge. It, it's a practice in the airlines that a, a pilot should always have been on the route before he, he flies in command on that route. So I went around the bulge via Lisbon, Las Palmas with Pi Pinar. I, when I was going through my sort of past life and looking back in the, in the aircraft, log books, um, I noticed that on a particular flight, I had simply noted against it. It came in a few hours late, and I'd noted against it, rerouted via Las Palmas. But um, those few words, in point of fact, tell a tremendous story, because the organization which was required completely to change our route pattern as it was done overnight without a single service being cancelled, so far as I know, was a, an amazing achievement, and uh, I think the, the people who were responsible for that deserve very great credit. So far as we were concerned here in London, um, obviously it caused complications. We had a very quick turnaround of aircraft. I had to eat at the airport, I had to sleep at the airport. Although I had accommodation in town, I couldn't use it because this aeroplane would just come out of the blue and uh, we'd have to handle it, and you must bear in mind that the equipment we had was not ideal at the time, and the number of passengers uh, we picked up there were minimum, but the number on board in transit was quite a number. And we used to try and keep them on board rather than have them disembark, because the facilities at Tadler One at the time were very inadequate. And we really were running then what we would say Burmanis out of uh, Luanda. That, as I say, was possibly the the, the finest hour of the, of the whole of the airline, even up to this date. And so, the skyways are clear, the obstacles overcome. The South African flag would now be carried aloft without hindrance. And for the next two decades, the rate of the Flying Springbok's progress would be astonishing, as air services are expanded to all six continents of the world.